An electrodiagnostic consultation usually includes EMG and neurography. The aim of the individual tests varies depending on the clinical situation. This means that EDX is not a laboratory test but a logical examination as a complement to the neurological findings. This will not be discussed in detail here, but a few points are made, hopefully taken as eye-openers and as a base for further discussions in your EMG lab. Here we see a few clinical conditions and the battery of available tests. Green squares indicate method of choice, red squares classify a test as less important. Let's take a few examples. When it comes to polyneuropathy, we have neurography and other tests to make. In the neurography, which I think is the most important, we are able not only to discuss that we got 37 meter per second, but many other things. And we should really try to find out uh, a few of these parameters and also report them in uh, the, the final conclusion. We should say something about the pathophysiology, namely demyelinating axonal and so on, f which fiber types are involved, fiber size, distribution, distal or proximal, and to some extent also the uh, severity. Autonomic tests when indicated can be made and in some cases is really important for example in Guillain-Barré and amyloidosis and what we do is uh, RR interval variation and a sympathetic skin response. EMG is not always necessary particularly when we follow a patient over time it may be uh, enough to have EMG at one of the occasions and then rather rely on neurography data. But if we do EMG, we must have some reason for that. And the reason is to assess the amount of axonal damage. Therefore, long nerves should be tested. Assess the uh, dynamics of the process if it is active re innovation or an old chronic situation. The distribution, distal proximal and asymmetric. And we should also exclude other reasons for the symptoms and perhaps uh, find other specific uh, uh, features of the neuropathy. The other tests that we can do is the small fiber testing, autonomic epidermal nerve fiber testing, thermo tests, and uh, so on. If we take the example of Guillain-Barré, we think that neurography also is the most important. And here we shall demonstrate motor and sensory involvement with a preponderance for the motor involvement, which is not typical for many other neuropathies. We shall also demonstrate conduction block, which is very important. We do not see conduction block in diabetic neuropathy, alcohol neuropathy. And try to assess this degree and severity of the pathological process. Here it may be important to make uh, autonomic testing. And what about EMG? Well, in the early phase, when you see a patient at day two, three, four, there is really no indication for EMG. You see a reduced interference pattern if there is weakness, otherwise nothing. Uh, motor unit number estimation techniques can be of uh, value, particularly Munich's which includes voluntary uh, contraction, not only stimulating the nerve peripherally, where it can be completely normal. Later in Guillain-Barré phase, after many weeks, we may see the denervation, we may see a beginning of re and so on. And here EMG can be um, 
of value. When we discuss focal nerve lesions, a very common situation in the EMG lab, neurography is, is certainly an important uh, test to make. If we have demyelinating changes or conduction block, then focal testing, it was uh, sometimes called inching or short segment studies. If we have an axonal lesion, then the short segment studies do usually not show so much and we may therefore have to go to EMG. If there is mainly sensory symptoms, we rely on the low distal amplitudes if there is an axonal inv involvement. But if there is normal distal amplitudes, we have to find focus in another way, for example, SEPs. Regarding EMG, it, in focal nerve lesions, it, it is used to localize the lesion. For example, focal axonal lesions and root lesions and we can assess the degree of axonal involvement and follow the re-innervation as well. I don't discuss the carpal tunnel and root. It, when we come to uh, motor neuron diseases, the EMG is probably the most important and it has been the most important until the uh, la last few decades. Namely with EMG we confirm generalized denervation and we see fasciculations which is unspecific but the absence of fasciculation is uh, pointing against uh, a motor neuron disease and we shall also exclude other acute diseases such as myopathy. For the uh, uh, MMN, we shall demonstrate focal uh, denervation. One nerve in an arm may be involved, but not the other. And here we come to neurography as important test in the question of motor neuron disease, namely to find whether it is or not is an MMN. So with ALS question, we uh, want to exclude the axonal neuropathy by uh, uh, looking at the sensory nerve action potential amplitude and also exclude uh, MMN, namely there is normally no conduction block in ALS. And on the other hand, if we think the patient has MMN, we shall demonstrate the motor conduction block in individual nerves, so we must test many nerves and usually have a normal uh, sensory finding. When it comes to patients with sequelae after polio, we do the EMG to confirm that the patient really have had a neurogenic involvement. Sometimes we find that uh, the patient has been misdiagnosed and instead had, for example, a stroke, subarachnoid bleeding or something. We can find also subclinical involvement. Muscles that are, are severely affected are in greater risk for the uh, so-called post-polio syndrome. We can assess the degree of motor neuron loss in different ways. One is by looking at the CMAP amplitude, but also by making other tests such as uh, motor unit number estimation tests. And we must remember that the patient that has had a polio before has no guarantee not to develop entrapment problems, radiculopathies and so on. The neurography in polio is not really of primary importance, but we may use it in case the, the symptoms are atypical. Myasthenia gravis, if we have single fiber EMG available, that is the most sensitive test. 
and one can start there uh, to find increased jitter with normal fiber density. That means jitter is not due to re innovation, and we do not expect a normal single fiber EMG finding in a muscle that is weak. That is definitely excluding myasthenia. But in many places we do not have the single fiber technique available and therefore repetitive nerve stimulation is uh, very useful. It is less sensitive, but if that technique shows positive results with typical finding then um, myasthenia is highly suspected, particularly if we do proximal muscles in a patient without treatment and the muscle is warm. There are other uh, situations where we have a uh, decrementing response also. lambert eaton myasthenia, myotonia and so on. And also in re innovation conditions such as ALS or post-traumatic nerve lesion. In myasthenia uh, we do not need to do a conventional routine EMG unless the symptoms are atypical. What we can see is variable amplitudes of motor unit potentials but otherwise nothing special. And here we can say that if we do neurography as a routine in, in many patients and find a low C-map. That should uh, alert the examiner to a neuromuscular problem, particularly uh, lambert eaton myasthenia. And uh, we must make a facilitation test to try to find whether neuromuscular junction is okay. In myotonia, EMG is the most important. We start there and we can find myotonic discharges, which will also assess whether the EMG is myopathic or not. There are, is a dividing line for different classes of myotonia with uh, simultaneous dystrophic changes or not. The distribution is important. Some myotonia become very uh, pronounced in low temperatures and some uh, are very much affected by uh, activity. The ordinary neurography is usually not necessary, but we have a special test described by Fournier where we can make studies of the CMAP behavior after short-term exercise and long-term exercise. This is the Fournier test that can be very useful. Genetic testing is certainly another thing. When it comes to muscular dystrophy, EMG is uh, very important with the typical findings of spontaneous activity which is not at all synonymous to denervation, but a membrane instability. We see small polyphasic motor unit potentials like this. They are polyphasic because of a large variation in fiber diameters that small fibers conduct more slowly and their signals are seen at the end of the motor unit complex. This is compared to the normal, the early recruitment and the dense interference pattern with development of very little force. And we do not expect normal EMG in uh, a muscular dy dystrophy, but in uh, the pediatric praxis, if we think the patient has a myopathy and the EMG is normal, then we should think of non-dystrophic conditions, uh, congenital um, conditions, mitochondrial changes. And we do not expect myotonia in a muscular dystrophy.
Haldensteiner's disease. IBM includes body myositis, the most common of the myositis is uh, similar thinking and the extra investigation that can be made is certainly CK muscle biopsy, genetic studies, MRI, CT or ultrasound. Small fiber neuropathy we already discussed a little and if we have a myelopathy which is a diffuse term we uh, can uh, start with uh, neurography and if the patient has sensory symptoms and neurography is normal that is very useful information so negative uh, result in the neurography is leading to idea that the problem is in the spinal cord. F responses are usually also abnormal in one way or the other. EMG, depending on type of myelopathy, can uh, be very abnormal in cases the motor neurons are involved in spinal cord lesions and uh, or in more specific situations. And then we have other tests like evoke potentials. If we have sensory symptoms, we do the somatosensory evoke potential. Motor symptoms, we do the magnetic stimulation evoke potentials. And if we have pain, there is a possibility to do a laser evoke potentials. Less uh, common and not at all a routine test. This will conclude the discussion. Thank you very much for your time.